everybody. Greetings, Starfighters. Welcome to Mad Science Films. I'm going to stop talking like that. I'm James Plum, filmmaker, sexual <laughs> astronaut, and as ever, I'm joined by my sinister co-host. James Morrissey. I'm not going to do the AKA because I keep saying my own nickname and it just sounds absolutely fucking stupid. It's lazy. Because you wanted to be a sexual astronaut, now I got to feel like I need to bring a nickname to the to the table, and I just fail every. Do a bit, do a bit of work, do a bit of homework, sit down in a room, and just think, who am I? Who am I? I'm James Morrissey, uh, one half of the Mad Science Films team. Welcome back, guys. So before we crack on with the show, don't forget to like and subscribe this video. The likes really help with the algorithm. So the more likes you give, the better for us. Okay, so let's crack on with the show. Lovely. Okay, so please check out our fourth feature film, uh, fourth feature film for free, too many Fs, on YouTube. Just search for Little Monster or click on the link in the show notes below. This week, we're back to campaigning for a forgotten masterpiece of genre cinema to be given the Blu-ray treatment. And we're joined by a very special guest and returning champion, the creator of the web series The Veil and BBC's The Golden Cobra. It is Mr. Adam Huallen. Welcome back, Adam. Thanks for having us, guys. No, no, no. Awesome to have you back, dude. Really enjoyed our chat before. And I think as soon as we got off the, the official chat, we were talking about uh, a movie that you guys could bring to us. And you pretty much had something straight away. So, Adam, what film are you hoping to bring before the Blu-ray gods and offer up to them? I'm bringing forward the Oscar winning uh, Japanese classic, uh, Food Over New Generation from 1996. <laughs> You know you what? I, I don't remember the Oscars. There were there were Oscars. They won twelve Oscars. I'm pretty sure. Like you know, best right. picture. There we go. <laughs> best screen. <laughs> no. um, sadly, won no Oscars. But um, yeah, I'm bringing forward uh, the 1996 classic "Food Over New Generation" from uh, Mr. Takashi Miki. Yes. Wow. Brilliant. So, Adam, what's your history with this film, there, man? Well, first off, um, Takashi Miki is like one of my favorite directors um straight off the bat I, I i collect his films i've been collecting his films since i was about 16 when i first got into him and i first ever saw happiness of the katakuras on dvd from my local blockbuster chain and um yeah i just i i remember buying this do you remember shop fop in cardiff uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. i remember I, I bought this uh a sort of like a, a double pack with full metal yakuza probably like 2005 maybe mm. and like i remember watching it during the January sales and just kind of watching them both back to back one night and just being what a night event, what a night of films that was, you know what I mean? Like it was just a great film. And uh, this one is always stuck as being like one of my favorite of his films. And I've always kind of gone back and watched it like once a year and um, I never see people talk about it. So I just kind of, when you said, when you asked if I'd like to do an episode of, of this show, which I listen to quite regularly, I was like, Oh, well let's do food of a new generation because Excellent. Um, no one ever talks about it. Yeah, good call, man. Good call. Yeah, I mean, I, I similar kind of background to it. Like, uh, like most people, I discovered uh, Mike through audition. You know, which got a big push at the time during the you know the big J horror push. Uh, I think I, I I got a legit copy through Love Film. Do you remember those guys when they actually used to post yeah. DVDs out there? Uh, yeah. Absolutely loved it. And so I was just like, you know, hopped on IMDb and I'm like, what else has this guy done? Um, and at the time, this this is going back as far as 2002, it, apart from audition, it was really difficult to get hold of anything like in the UK. So I went on eBay <laughs> uh, and I was just like, right, OK, typing in random films uh, of his stuff, because I was like, you know, reading online about all the stuff about Ichi, uh, the killer and Visitor Q and like just, yeah, happiness of Katakaris, as you said, just batshit crazy stuff. And I was like, I need to see this stuff. So there was, yes, yeah, this pirate uh, guy who went by the, the seller name of Uzumaki, which automatically, you know, it's a good guy. Uh, and he sent me like this Word document with hundreds of like just crazy Asian horror stuff. And I spent a lot of money that month uh, getting all the stuff. Problem is, because there was no covers or anything like this, uh, it all just blurred into one. So like I binged like pretty much all of Miki's stuff up until, yeah, like, 2002 so we're talking uh yeah itchy the killer the dead are alive definitely the first one i think the second one as well i saw around about that point vista q uh full metal yakuza uh, fudo at the time as well but what was mad was like some of his stuff like um oh god uh ley lines um and other ones like that 
I wouldn't have realized at the time, uh, apart from IMDb, it was the same director because he didn't seem kind of like stuck in one genre. He was just like all over the place. Apart from the fact that it was so like crazy and like, you know, you'd, you'd start in one genre and then just go on weird tangents. That was the only thing that kind of linked them all together. Um, so yeah, big fan. And yeah, similar to, to what you were saying, dude, when you said this one hadn't had a Blu-ray release, I was just like, oh yeah, no, you're right. Um, and I, I can't really see why that is the case. So awesome. No, that's brilliant. So Jim, what is your history with this film? Nil poir. All right. Then. Um, I'm not very well versed in the uh, Asian cinema. I didn't catch that bug back in the day, unfortunately. So this is, I mean, I've popped in and out. I've caught Itchy the Killer. I've caught, you know, and the odd film here and there, but not really stuck to um, or been heavily into that kind of cinema. So it's pretty interesting to hear my point of view when I uh, watch this film. So uh, I think because I haven't got that history, um, particularly with this director as well, I found this film quite mental. So um, there's a I lot think, of... I think, to be honest, man, like, it's it's mental whether you've seen all of his stuff yeah. or whether this is his yeah. first film. It's, yeah, but even for his stuff. A bit, I, I, I guess it's almost like, you know, never having sugar, then getting a double-glazed donut for the first time. It's like, fucking, what the hell is going on here? So um, I found myself questioning a lot of who each character was and their, their relevance to the story. What was their arc? They just seemed to come in and then go. And then, so, and then also wasn't sure how to take the tone of the film in terms of the, the horrific uh, killings and things like that. Am I supposed to laugh at this? Or should, should I be afraid? Uh, that kind of stuff. So I had a lot of questions um, throughout the film. Um, but that said, it was quite enjoyable. Um, and I found myself just watching it thinking, do you know what? I'm not too sure what the fuck's going on, but I'm enjoying that not knowing. And I'm quite eager to see what the hell's going to happen next. So yeah, there was a lot of moments in that film like, what? She's got a penis? You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, I had, uh, I had a lot of fun watching it. Um, I still don't know what the fuck's going on with it, um, but that's okay. Exactly, Jim. I, th I think you've summed it up perfectly well is you've just got to embrace it and go for the ride. Um, and unlike some other films, which, you know, like we've reviewed on the show as well, it is so entertaining that it, it does, it carries you through the film and it, yeah, yeah. it just stands out. I, I, think, I think I've done this before with other um, uh, films we've watched for the, for, for the show where I'm like, I, I have less of a fun time if I'm trying to understand it. I just need to let go of what a narrative is. <laughs> just, I will say, and I'm sure yeah, I will back us up on this though, it is a film that like definitely improved on multiple viewings. Um, I would say in terms yeah, of- I was I've that, yeah, I was going to ask that, yeah. I've definitely seen it about five times at least, yeah. two times for reviewing it and, and, and a handful of times previously. Uh, Adam, yeah. did, this is, is, is this something you've watched many times? Oh yeah, I've, this is one of the ones I. This is one of the you know those films you have in your collection which you just always spin on, like once a year or something. This is just this is one of those films that I always just kind of. Yeah. It yeah. just kind of does the rounds. Like I, I like I said, I, I watch loads. Of, I've seen loads of films by the director, and um and like I said, this is one of my favorite ones. I it's def is in my top five of his films, hundred percent. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I I can imagine that through my um confusion and, and, and excitement i probably missed a few little nuggets along yeah. the way so you know perhaps like a few more watches i could pick up on those and have a more um all-round view of the film and what the fuck was going on but uh, no, yeah no. spanning on what adam was saying like yeah I, I i call those kind of films adam like chicken soup films you know you just put if you want to feel if you want to feel good there's like a handful of films and for me it's stuff like uh, john carpenter's prince of darkness uh, Army of Darkness, Evil Dead 2. You know, it's it's those go-to uh -huh. films where you're kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I don't even want to think about what I want to watch tonight. I'm just going to put on yeah. an old favourite. Um, and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, good call with uh, Fudo. And you know what? Yeah, I can, after re-watching it, you know, like two times in, in you know, close succession, I can imagine watching him again, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was like, a, it was like if, it was like if Scorsese was asked to do a Japanese Saved by the Bell 
You know what I mean? I had a lot of things going on there. And uh, <laughs> I, I would love to see Scorsese do a remake of Fudo, the new generation, just to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, like. you know, he's, he's, he's obviously aware of like Asian cinema. He did that remake of Infernal Affairs. So, yeah, sure, Fudo, why not? Weird. Because one, one, one thing you say about like mafia films and, and gang films, there's always that element of paranoia which they play upon, don't they? Like who's backstabbing who, who's going to be next, and all that. And there's definitely a lot of that in this film. You know, obviously, your own father could you know kill their son. I mean, that's I mean, if that doesn't make you fucking paranoid, then what will? Oh, so um, definitely, you can see that goes that kind of uh, inspiration probably in Scorsese's work and vice versa. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Good fun. It's a lot of comedy elements. A lot of a lot of throwaway lines like um what's the one with the eggplant dick put in women in hospital and yeah. it's just they really laugh out chuckles and just like over the top um like do you know when the one school girl standing up and taking a leak like like yeah. they, they, they they it's just happens in the background like you could have missed that um, but I caught up on it and I, I thought is she using a like a kind of dart blowing pipe urinate and then of course later on you find out no it actually wasn't that it was actually a penis so uh <laughs> lovely bit of fault lovely bit of foreshadowing for later on that scene yes yeah, beautiful so, yeah. and, and not something i picked up the first few times i think literally i only picked that up on the last viewing so again yeah it, it yeah. pays off with multiple viewings i mean i think one of the main things that i really dig about it um which i haven't seen in that many other films is the idea of yes it's a yakuza movie but with kids and, it, and, you know, like, they're no less dangerous because of that. If anything, they're more dangerous because they don't feel, like, bound by, you know, the, the old rules or anything. And that's a big thing that, you know, they, 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 they say time and time again, you know, like, killing the past, moving on and all that stuff. And I, I, I yeah. love that. And I love the fact that, you know, most of the time they're still in school when all this <laughs> shit's going down. The bit with the teacher and you think, you know, like, the English teacher at the beginning, you think he's going to get, yeah. you know, um, Ricky, isn't it? You think it's going to get a bollock in, and then you know it completely flips, and the teacher's begging, you know, for forgiveness. And then, of course, later on, you know, you see his seven heads being kicked about by kids. I mean, brilliant, absolutely amazing. Um, and like, even more like using stuff like, and I found this really like, even even like on my most recent watch, even though I knew it was coming, the bit where the little kids shoot like the first of the gang bosses. Like for me, that's mm. just like whoa. That you know, that is still transgressive. I mean, this was what was it, ninety six, Adam? Yeah, ninety six. Yeah, ninety six. You know, we're now you know like twenty seven years later, and it still packs a hell of a punch. My maths is terrible there. It twenty something years later, and it still packs a hell of a punch. So yeah, wow. Oh god, yeah. It's like it's it just it does it just goes for the jugular. The film does, man. I mean, like. Like even with the two young lads in it, like you know these these two like cute little like five year old Japanese kids, and then later on they come up against Ricky Takayuchi's character. Yep, and it's just a hard cut to them off in bin bags, just like yep. Yeah. Like, Fuck, it's just like yep. That's I, what it's I, like. I love the fact that like he he like Mike Mike plays with it. So there there are times when he'll go full gore. You know, like like yeah. the second the second gang boss, and you know, drinking that poison or whatever that causes a huge amount of blood just to like yeah. knock like the other henchman out of the car. There's so much blood. I mean, what the fuck? But then there's other times when he'll hold back and he'll 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 you know won't show certain things and he'll cut and it's even more effective. Like the first the first time you see, um, you know, Papa Fudo kill Ryu. You yeah. know, you just see the action and then you cut to little Ricky's reaction and it's just like, wow, okay. And then later on, obviously, he reveals what actually went down, which you wouldn't think makes it more fucked up. But if anything, the fact that, you know, he's really going for it in the, the, the last revelation, you know, where you see what, what actually goes down, it's like he progresses it. Um, and yeah, just it's amazing the decisions he makes in terms of what to show and what not to show in terms of gore. Yeah. Um, Right, it, it is more effective to kind of open the tap and close the tap, isn't it? Because if you constantly stream it out, you're going to be like, yeah, you know, desensitized to it almost. So it's almost better to kind of do it like that. Yeah, I mean, we've 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 had occasions like Jim on uh, Silent Night, Bloody Night, like the the second film we did. Like uh, there was one of the kills where we, you know we killed somebody with a chair leg, 
uh, and we had the gore and we had the reaction and everything and like you know when it came to the edit room we we're like actually you know it kind of works better you just you, you you see the action and then you cut and and you know let the audience yeah, yeah. do the work um mm. but yeah adam obviously as a filmmaker yourself have you you know ever, ever kind of decided to to make that call as well where you've had effects and you kind of went hey you know what don't need to see it Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, like, it's that thing, isn't it? Leave it to the audience's imagination. But sometimes, I mean, like, obviously, I make a lot of comedy stuff mainly. So, um, but like, um, like sometimes, you know, I use the violence and I just, I, I go over the top with violence sometimes just because it's funnier that way because it's so unnecessary, if that makes yeah. sense. But yeah, yeah, it just kind of, it kind of depends really of what the story, what the mood and tone is of the scene, really. I mean, like, mm. it's like you said, like, um, it's like Where's Our Dogs, right? I mean, the bit when he cuts the ear off. I mean, if you, how, how good is that scene when you watch it? Like, you know, with the camera, yeah, yeah, just yeah. using it as one example. There's loads of films yeah. that do it there, but um, camera drifts off. I mean, if you actually saw Madsen just sewing his ear off, it'd be horrible, but yeah, I don't think it'd be as, I don't think it'd be as memorable. And yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Fine. But it, it is one of those tools that we have in the bank as filmmakers to, to, to hold back. And it's, and I think it's knowing that sometimes it's actually more effective. And like you said, yeah. depends on the scene and the tone and what have yeah. you, but. I mean, good call, Adam. Definitely, because with that one, it's the sound, isn't it? Because you're you're you're, yeah, you're drifting yeah. away, but you're hearing the cops' screams. Um, mm. And again, like Jim, we we found an example, say in Little Monster, where we kept on the image, but we took away the audio, and it was more powerful. So, like when Martin uh, like vomits in the toilet, breaks down, and you know, we had the cut originally. We had the audio of him mm. sobbing and like you know, like you know flagellating himself or whatever and then we yeah. did a cut we, we we tried it we took away the audio and it was just you know like yeah like the score and it was like fuck like it was a great performance but then it goes next level with it and so yeah i think as, as jim you were saying mate like all these tricks as filmmakers have you know either not showing it or uh, at all or just having the audio or just having the picture brilliant and yeah mm -hmm. miko Mike, like at this stage i mean this is early on in his career um just having absolute mastering of it having said that though i mean this is round about the period where wasn't he making like three or four films a year or something ridiculous oh, like yeah. that? Roger, i mean this is like i mean you say early on in his career this still is let's have a look it still is like i think it's about his 22nd film yeah. this one is yeah. so you know i've and i've this period of his film of his tenure as a filmmaker is one of my favorites actually i mean he can he was kind of going up like this is his this was his second cinematic film the second yeah. theatrical release yeah because he made a lot he made v cinema um when he first started off yeah. um the story goes to him but there was a, there's a director called shohei imamura that made films like vengeance is mine and stuff and um yeah. he was he started off as an ad for him and then kind of just through chance kind of when he was about in his like late 20s fell into doing uh straight to straight to video films i think his first film was um his first film was i catch junction and he, he double billed I Catch Junction and Lady Hunter, Prelude to Murder, in 91. Mm. And, you know, he just kind of got back. His first couple of films were really junky and, like, you know, just kind of really cheap and nasty action films. But then this was kind of him. Then he made, in 95, he made Shinjoku Triad Society, yeah. which Arrow have released on, yeah. on Blu-ray. Yeah. And it's one of, his one of his better films, in my opinion. And then I think this was about, let's have a look, this was... One, two, three, four, five films later, he yeah. made Food Over New Generation in 1996, a year later. One so. year later, yeah, which is mental. And as you say, yeah, I mean, obviously that kind of is geared towards that straight to video aesthetic yeah. that like Japan enabled their directors to do because, yeah, yeah, he was shooting a more traditional film style. Obviously, he wouldn't have been able to churn out quite so many, you know, maybe only two or three films a year as opposed to yeah, five or six. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I did a bit of background reading on this one as well. I, I obviously I know that the film back then he's, he would shoot his films in about two weeks. All his films are shot in two weeks, but um, he did say that uh, this one did go over and it was shot in three weeks instead. Right. And um, it, got, it they had a budget of two hundred uh, forty million yen is what they had, but uh, which is two hundred fifty thousand pounds, which was the same budget as like a sort of um Saturday afternoon housewife drama they'd have yeah. in japan at the time and that's sort of what they were given they shot it in three weeks and uh when they were in the edit when they were in the editing room uh one of the producers from gaga productions the um company behind the film um just immediately made a call and were like right we're going to uh put this over to print instead of releasing it to video because they were so impressed with it and they just spent 36 grand right then and there that day and put the film to print and Brilliant. it went over it went over to film festivals like toronto and um it was the one that really put him on the map, really. I mean, this is the one that kind of got the 
just got the attention on him. And then um, it is said that apparently this is the one which um, first got international audiences realizing that Japan were making really fucking weird stuff. <laughs> And, I mean, uh, you know, he's pretty much ticking all those boxes, you know, like yeah. death by vagina. That that already gets a view. Yeah. But then, you know, herma- add the hermaphrodite to the mix as well. Even better. I mean, fantastic, man. <laughs> Little did, kids did murder. He, did Sorry, he write sorry. this as well? Is this? Uh, no, he, uh, he doesn't. The only film he's ever written, he's. I think he's he's written two of his screenplays, and I think oh, I can't remember which ones they are. I think one of them. I think I think he co-wrote Agitator. This film agitator, and then there's another one he wrote as well. I can't remember. Uh, look, well, I've seen. I yeah, Lesson of the Evil. He wrote the screenplay for as well. Okay, and it's just those two. He's he's oh, and Sukiyaku West and Django. He wrote. He wrote three of his films, and that's sort of it, really. And um, that, yeah, I'm just interested who wrote like this film. Like, it's but it's based. It's based right. on a manga. It's based on a manga. Um, uh, makes uh, sense, the yeah. manga was the manga was never completed because the magazine. The manga ran in was cancelled, so the manga's just unfinished. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, I, I, there was I, some I, shots there. I think there was a fight scene, and uh, he's kicking him through walls and all that. And I thought that seems like like a manga kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, like oh, and, and I love I love that stuff, and like especially like that opening scene. Uh, you know, like in the yeah. walls and like talking yeah, about yeah. overkill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like you know, after the first like two gunshots, like I think you got him. But it's just again rivers of blood, you know, like it's raining bullet cases. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Just, just as a quick aside, I just looked up the screenwriter. I've got IMDb on the side next to me. Um, his name is uh, I'm going to butcher his pronunciation here, but Toshiyuki Morioka, Moriaki. Um, but yeah, he he also he wrote one other Mike film, which is Blues Harp from oh, okay. uh, ninety eight, which is actually which is a pretty good film. Uh, uh, is a release from Germany. Which I've got downstairs, um, which has English subtitles on there. If it, but it, that's a straight yakuza drama. There's no craziness yeah, yeah. in that. That's a that's a full on drama about yeah, yeah. Uh, two yakuzas that mm. want to be musicians. <laughs> um, I also noticed Adam, and I I think this links directly back to the veil. It you know connects this film to the veil is the evil PE teachers. You know, like yeah. you know. There's a character in the film, uh, which you know. Again, I'd like to think you somehow subliminally were inspired by this film as well. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the PE teacher in this film is fucking amazing, man. Like, I love that. Ca- I love that character. He's just, he's just so fucking stone cold, isn't he? Like, he just, <laughs> he just yeah. goes for it. Like, the only thing he gets passionate about is like, yeah, kimchi. As far as I can see, so like everything else is yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> <want that. laughs> well, that was funny. That is. You fuck yeah. up the sauce. <laughs> would you love? Would you love to do that though? Just go back at the restaurant sometimes and just absolutely. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've been lucky. I've never. I've like touch words. I'm sure it'll happen now, but I've never had a really bad restaurant experience. So you know, I'm okay. Um, Jim, imagine- I know. I know you. You were unimpressed with Jamie Oliver back in the day. It was awful. If Jamie Oliver was there, I would have fucking kicked him in the throat. It was the worst meal. An expensive meal. Uh, literally like a piece of toast with half a chicken breast and just like chopped tin tomatoes over the top. It was absolutely pathetic. Actually, went to Powerline Street for a kebab. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, of course, Chippy Alley down the, down yeah, the road. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing that was uh, Jamie's Italian, was it? Yeah, yeah. It was awful, mate. Honestly, the, very expensive piece of crap. <laughs> no. Very expensive piece yeah. of crap. There we go. <laughs> Awesome. He's got a business now, I think, actually. So there we go. There we are, Jim, <laughs> obviously. To, to bring it back to Fudo, sorry, Jim. I mean, it's my fault. I kind of took us on that tangent. Um, absolutely love the ending as well um, of, you know, like that cut to black of, oh, shit's about to go down. Um, mm. And kind of like the Matrix ending, you know, like the, the first Matrix where he, he flies up in the sky and you're like, oh, great. And then they kind of make the mistake of doing the sequels. Now, I haven't seen the sequels, I didn't even know they existed until Adam, you gave me the heads up that the, the sequels exist. Have you actually seen the the, the sequels two and three? No, uh, I did torrent because you can't get them anyway. I did torrent number two, but um, there's no subtitle track on there. I did skim through it a little bit there. It's by a different director. It's the same director. I, I think he double billed two and three. I think he shot them back to back. Right. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Because obviously the first one was quite success was very successful in Japan, so they made the, the, another two films. But no, I've never seen it. If, they, if there was an English subtitle track for them, I would watch them. But um, it's not Takashi Miike, so I'm uh, obviously bearing that in mind. But uh, to be honest, I can't. In, in the same with the, with the Matrix, you kind of 
want to leave it to the audience. You know, like it doesn't yeah. really matter who wins at the end of the battle. It's just the fact that, you know, it takes it to the next level. You don't need to see that because whatever they show you in the sequels can't possibly live up to it. And, and Ricky's story really is kind of dead, you know, done. You know, he's killed, like his actual brother is dead. He's killed his dad. He killed his step half brother, step whatever. You know, like most of his his gang are, are, are killed now. Um, what more is there to say? You know, it's a kick-ass ending. That kind of should have been left there. But I get it absolutely from a financial point of view. If it's a success, you know, and it's kind of left open enough, churn out those sequels, guys. Yeah. So I do, uh, yeah. I will say though, I reckon Noma would have kicked the shit into Ricky. I don't know why. But, um, I don't <laughs> yeah. think. Ricky's a great character, but he's not that tough as he is. Like he's more like a, he's a button man kind of yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He he he's the mastermind behind it. Um, and I I absolutely love the fact that he is just like so monotone through the whole thing. Like you know, very rarely do you see any sort of reaction from him. But that plays to you know the idea that obviously he saw this thing as a kid that completely traumatized him. Um, and yeah, it is it's some, not just about like um, Japanese or Hong Kong cinema. Uh, you know, you get it a lot in the West, but especially with like, you know, like uh, crime films or film noir, you get those kind of monotone characters, don't you, who are, you know, we see as, you know, we're supposed to identify with. Um, it's that every man blank kind of slate, isn't it? Um, and I love the fact that, you know, they, they try to do that in this film, despite the fact of how crazy and mental it goes. But I guess that's your that's your entryway. Like if, if Ricky himself was this weird zany character. I don't think there's an entry point for the audience to kind of connect to. Um, yeah. And I kind of picked that up more on my last viewing than I did on the other ones. Cause you know, you kind of, you because you see it through Ricky's eyes, especially when he's a kid and you get that dissolve, don't you? When he's a kid, he dissolves away and then adult Ricky kind of you know, yeah. fades back into view. Spot on though, absolutely. I, I, love, I love that shot. I, I, I don't know why, but um, I know it's really corny, but I just love that. It's not Mikkei, though. It doesn't feel Mikkei at all. And compared yeah. to everything that comes later, it's actually kind of slow and you know meditative that you're kind yeah. of like, oh, okay, this is going to be a different kind of film. And then oh, yeah. it's not a different kind of film at all. I, I, I love the cinematography in this film. I, I, I know it's like... The, this is why you need a Blu-ray treatment, right? Because um, it's shot on, like... I think it, it seems like it's shot... I don't know much about, like, cameras and stuff, but um, it seems like it's shot on, like, a really old, like, type of film, like... I, I don't know. They had that 90s gloss, didn't it? So it is probably yeah. shot on film. And if they're low budget, probably, yeah, probably like older cameras. Like cheap uh, film stock, maybe? Like really low grade film stock. But it's just got like, <laughs> but but even though it looks like that, it has this really cool look to it. Like I just love like the angles they choose and stuff in there. Yeah. Very creative, yeah. But I think that is that kind of uh, anime inspired, Definitely. those angles, those yeah. point of views. Like when she's falling and the camera's on her face as she's, you know, it's very interesting. But I think it is probably inspired by that. But yeah, it, a, lot so the worms I, a lot of the worms yeah. I view as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, when you're, you're kind of seeing like, um, oh, I forget the character name, the, you know, the big bulky wrestler guy. Oh, uh, like um, Esimo and Davis. Yeah, Esimo. that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you see some of that stuff, and they really play that up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then you know, again, looking down on the on the the little kids to make them seem even smaller after you know yeah. they, they, they commit these murders. It's just brilliant. And it, and as as you say, I mean, obviously he'd done twenty odd films at that point. Um, you know, even like you know the the shot on video or the V cinema stuff. He knew what he was doing. Um, yeah. and this is back in 90, 97. So you know, like we're we're, we're 20 plus years on and he's still going which is fantastic I know. It's, it's, just think though like two years after this he made audition how, how do you make how does someone work so much like it's just it blows my mind like i can't think of any i can think of other directors like from like italy and spain in back from way back in the day that cranked them up like that but um not of that quality not that quality and variety um and yeah. i think that's that's still why i'll always if you know if if i find on arrow you know, a new one of his films or on any of the streaming services I've got, I'll check it out because I, I will not yeah. know what I'm getting. And even if it's in the same genre, you know, like he did quite a few samurai movies recently. I say recently, probably like 10 years ago, but he did quite a few samurai movies. Tonally, they could still be all over the shop. Uh, yeah. So he's always a surprising director. Um, and yeah, I'll always definitely check out his stuff. So again, Adam, yeah, good call on this definitely long overdue a blu-ray treatment and and do you have any idea why out of all of his films this is one that hasn't had blu-ray treatment yet 
a lot of his films don't. Well, the thing is, the guy's made about a hundred, and he's made let's look at the exact number, one hundred and eleven films. Right, he's made that. He's made a lot of films, but I think the main issue is now. I actually like my my favorite. I I do. I love all the boutique labels like Arrow and Third Third Window or Third Eye Films or whatever they're called, and like Indicator and stuff. And um, and that's kind of the companies that kind of go but pick these up now. But um, there have been a couple of times where I've like messaged those companies and just said just just being like, how come you don't release more films with this director? Not like, I know we're not going to just go like, this guy's right, let's release it now because of that. But I just just asking the questions there. Yeah. Yeah. But the answers back I've always got, and this was from Third Window Films, was that um, the rights are just a nightmare of them. Like they're all, they're tied up. Like the the company that released this back in like the early 2000s was Arts Magic. Oh, and they, yeah, did, yeah. they did like a lot of his films. They also released loads of films like Junk, the um, Japanese zombie Japanese movie. Zombie one. I, I rewatched that recently, actually. So yeah. weird that you said it. Yeah, yeah. Wild Wild Zeros, the Wild Zero, Japanese brilliant. one, like um, yeah. a lot of like so, a lot of Maki films, like Yakuza action movies. No, and um, Lone Wolf and Cub as well. Weirdly, that company were based in Eberville. You know Holy shit! Yeah, mm. based in Eberville. They were based in Rasser Industrial Estate in Eberville. And um, I, 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 I remember I had the Lone Wolf and Cub box sets. I was looking yeah. at the back of it one day, and I just saw. And I have a veil address on the back there. I was like, what the actual fuck is this by you? And I, I've got I actually, that downstairs. Right after we get off this call, I'm going to go down and have yeah, a look. It had, it had an Ebbeville address on the back. And I walked, I walked there. I walked to the I walked to the Rassel Industrial Estate. I was about 15, 16. Yeah. And I just saw the little Art Magic logo on top. I was like, wait, wow. I didn't knock the door, but I was like, should have done. Should have done, Adam. That's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Should have done. But they, they released crazy <laughs> Japanese films and railway and steelwork documentaries. Yeah, I can see the connection there. Definitely, man. Definitely. Just really, really weird. But, uh, but anyway, I've um, gone on a tangent there. But um, yeah, I, I think it's just a case of the rights are just tied up and a, and a bit of a nightmare. But I, but whenever they come out, Mike Films go on. Like, some, like the last one they did, I think it was Graveyard of Honor. It was double packed with the um, original yeah. one by Kinji Fukuzaku. Yeah, did, and then the, new, the newer ones, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really funny name to say as well. I love saying his name. Can you? <laughs> so. Okay, you. so link to that then. Uh, one of the parts of the show that we do is which Blu-ray label do you think is best uh, to put this bad boy out? So, Adam, who, who do you reckon? Who, who are we going to pester? I would love Arrow Video to put this one out. Oh, and I would love Arrow Video to do a thing where they do like this, number two and three. Mm. Never going to happen, but a nice triple bill box set with all three. If I'm all nicely remastered, especially the first one. And, um, you know, a nice book to go with it. Maybe the manga. I don't know. It's never going to happen. But, uh, you know, you've got to, you've, got to, you've got to dream big, right? But um, I would buy that box set in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Yeah. No, good call. Jim, what about yourself, man? Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm just going off a little bit of research. So probably AA Films, maybe. They've got an Asia department, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Films. Um, and I had Third Window Films as well. Uh, yeah, Third yeah, Window. Album. Oh. They've got quite, I'm not quite sure what the relationship is with Arrow, but they have got quite a close link with Arrow as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with those. I, I'd also say Arrow, a lot of his stuff, if other people want to check out his stuff, a lot of his stuff is on Arrow Player at the at the moment as well. Um, I, again, like I've, I've seen them all, but I've, put, I've added after, uh, you know, like Adam told us, you know, he was going to do this show. I've added them to my watch list again for a rewatch. Um, yeah, they they've got the earlier one uh, that you mentioned. What was it? Uh, the Shinjuku Triad Society. Yes, yeah, it's, it's got that on there as well, which is uh, like a couple of years before, or one year before. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a box set. It's um, it's the it's the Black Society trilogy box set. So you get that one, Rainy Dog and Ley Lines, and I I've, I've got them. Those days. It's a it's a lovely remaster. That is. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, haven't haven't seen since the the VCD days. Uh, so that but that is one I'll definitely be uh, checking out again. Yeah. Cool. All righty. So Adam, people have checked out this film. They are ready for something else to follow up the night with. They're not ready to go to bed. What film do you suggest that they check out next? I've got I've got seven recommendations. Right. I, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna reel them off pretty quickly. Right. Okay. I'll get coming. The, the first one I'd say is Shinjoku Triad Society. I, I reckon that's. Everyone always says Ley Lines is the best of the trilogy, but I I just prefer the first one. I think Shinjoku Triad Society is the best one. I think that's a really good... I think it kind of gets into that feel of just, like, that doomed society is fucked, like, Tokyo sort of, like, vibe Mikkei was going for back then. Mm-hmm. Um, next, I've got Full Metal Yakuza, because I think it's just got the craziness in there. Yeah. I think... And it's, it's also the film I first ever double build with when I first started. So I always kind of put the films together when yeah, I think yeah. about... I can see that, definitely, yeah. Uh, Dead or Alive, 
you know, these are all Mickey films so far, but I got a couple of that aren't. Um, I would also say if you want to d- dig a bit deeper, it's a bit harder to find, but um, the film he made before this in 95, The Way to Fight, which is oh. kind of like, kind of got that Japanese youth thing going on. It's not as good as Fudo, but it's got that thing with like youth gangs in there and stuff. It's, cool. it's, more, okay. it's more of a martial, it's more like a martial arts film, but um, I think it's a really good, that's a really good one. Um, the final one I'm going to recommend by Mickey, and I got two of it aren't then, is uh, Visit a Q. Yeah, good call. Now, completely different movie, I know, but Visit a Q has that, this film has that sort of, just Japanese youth is doomed and fucked up sort of thing going through and through. And I think Visit a Q just kind of further plunges that down. Visit a Q is more depressing, though, I will say yeah. that. But, um, yeah. but it's a good film. I, I really like Visit a Q. Even yeah, though I, I get, again, I think I saw that Full Metal Yakuza and Fudo together, uh, and Itchy the Killer all on the same day, and that was a roller coaster of emotions that day. You know, so, you know what uh, I Jim, I hope you're taking notes here. Really. Do you know when I first ever saw Visit a Queue on the Sci Fi channel? And it was on at like half ten at night. Really? On, on the, I swear on my, I swear down. It was on, it was on the Sci Fi channel. Hmm. I'd like, I, I knew what it was, but I was like, oh, whoa, because I was going to rent it from Blockbuster. And I saw in the TV guide that week, because I used to see what was on sci-fi, because he used to yeah. play slasher films and stuff on there every Friday. Yeah. Yeah, we did a queue on. I was like, what the fuck? Like, and I like, tuned in and watched it, and they had it on fully uncut. And, I was gonna, um, that was going to be my next question. Was it, was it fully uncut? Yeah, and, it okay, was, wow. Completely fully uncut. It had all of it had the dead body stuff in there. The... <laughs> oh, Jim. Just, Jim, you, you wait and see. You, you, you make an effort to track down this kid. Visit a queue, mate. I can't wait. Oh, but I'm, I'm learning so much. I'm learning so much. <laughs> oh, actually, yeah. Just go into visit a queue completely blind, man. Yeah, I, I, I'm telling you right now. From the moment that film starts, you were just like, "This is the most fucked thing I've ever seen in my life," and it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> there you as go. It goes on. But um, okay, what else we got? Uh, last two. Um, Crying Freeman, the American manga adaptation. Yeah, with uh, our, our friend Mark Moskos from um, Drive. Jim, do you remember Dave? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah I love that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I love Crying Freeman. Like, it just, I know, it, I don't know, I know it's completely different, but like, I think it's just the fact it's a manga adaptation, but like, I don't know, it just um, kind of get a similar feel from it. And um, just, I think it's a really good film. And the uh, final one is Violent Cop by Beat Takeshi. Nice. Okay. And only because it's more doomed Japanese society and crime. And I just think, but um, why not? What a, what a night, what a day of entertainment that would be if you watched all seven of them. Oh, Jesus. Be depressing, man. Depressing. Oh, yeah, you, you jump out of a window by the end. Yeah. <laughs> right, Jim, what have you got for us, dude? I'm just going to second what Adam has just said, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I watched this film yesterday, and I'm still trying to get my head around it, and I cannot think on the top of my head with my very poor um, or lack of experience with Japanese cinema. So, yeah, I have... I can't think of anything... Okay, so, right. yeah, no I think Adam's nailed a lot of this, so I just... I gotta, you're going you're to follow Adam's out. recommendations. Cool. Yes. I've got a bit of over- overlap with Adam's as well. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. also went for Shinjuku Triad Society for much the same reasons as you, Adam. I then also then jo- jumped over to Hong Kong. So moving away from Japan, uh, I went for School on Fire by Ringo Lam. I just, I love the On Fire trilogy. So obviously the most famous of which yeah. is City on Fire, which, you know, Questionably was inspired inspired Reservoir Dogs, Prison on Fire, uh, but my favourite is School on Fire, just because it's just the most mental of the trilogy. I've only ever seen uh, City on Fire. It's a great film. Oh, check out the other two. Prison on Fire is really depressing. Uh, yeah. School on Fire has that manic energy, ott um, yeah. which he kind of then brought on to uh, Full Contact on, on those other films. Uh, and the other one, again, is Hong Kong cinema. They made loads of them. Uh, I've seen at least the first two, the Young and Dangerous series. And again, that's just like kid gangs. Um, it's like teenagers uh, in, in the Yakuza. Uh, no, the triad, sorry. Definitely worth a watch. Uh, the first handful were definitely done by Andrew Lau, Andy Lau. Um, I'm not even sure if you can kind of catch them legally. Again, I'm basing this off my old VCD collection. But if you can track them down, definitely worth a watch. Have you have you seen any of the Young and Dangerous series? I have not. No, I have not. I I'm more in I, ch- Chinese films um, are ones I'm not as versed in as uh, Japanese cinema for whatever reason. But um, I will definitely have a look. Uh, yeah. Again, I mean, I I I fully I got on board. God bless Blockbuster back in the day uh, in the Midlands. They had like John Woo stuff. So they they had the killer. They had Hard Boiled, um, yeah. and that was my 
gateway drug into Asian cinema. So that was the way I got in back in the like yeah. 90s. So yeah. the, 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 um, the big ones I've seen by John Moore, Killer Hard Boiled. I've seen um, The Better Tomorrow, one and two. Yeah. And yeah, I've seen, um, I've seen uh, Once a Thief, Bullet in the Head. Um, yeah. I've, I've seen Face Off and his American stuff, but those are the only uh, Chinese ones I can think of seen by him. Literally, again, this this was the, the, the great thing was, yeah, I, I saw the first two, and, and bear with me two secs, here we go. I got this book, right, which is, as you can see, dog-eared and just like, nice. right, Sex and Zen uh, and a bullet in the head. And I just went through, and however I could find these films, I found them. Yeah. Um, so many mental things. This, Jim, this was also the one that introduced me to the Jiang Shi. So, you know, the hopping vampire genre and all of that. Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah, even yeah. know about that before I got, I got this book. And this was my gateway drug oh, to nice. finding everything Hong Kong cinema. So I don't even know if this is available anymore. Uh, who was it? Stefan Han- Hammond and Mike Wilkins. This, this was great. I mean, obviously, this only goes up to late 90s, I think. But but yeah, that that was a brilliant just gateway into that Hong Kong cinema stuff. Yeah, I'm from, I'm from there. Then you know, I just I expanded it out to Korean and Japanese cinema and whatever I could get my hands on. Um, again, just quickly as well to any listeners, um, I've got a book downstairs. Um, I would show it on camera, but it's in my room downstairs. Um, Agitator by Tom Mez. Um, yeah, it's a good one to get. Uh, that's um that's a very good guide to finding films by. Oh, you've got it. Yeah, I've got the same copy. I've got the same copy. Yeah. Uh, downstairs. I've also got the um, Reagitator sequel. That came I haven't out, got so. that one. Yeah, I want to. I want to pick that one up. So that's more, that's everything like 2002 onwards, isn't it? I think it's it's, it's more a book of interviews. Uh, oh, okay. And I think Agitator is a better the better one, but Reagitator is worth a grab as well. But it's more interviews in that in that one, if I remember. Yeah. But um, but Agitator's it's got like a bit it's got like a big clump at the end, but it's like how to track these films down and um. Uh, ah yeah, yeah yeah. I've rifled through that section many a time. Yeah. No, brilliant. Ah, so, so great recommendations, guys. Righty, have you guys seen Fudo, uh, the new generation? What did you guys think? Are there any other films that you think would go perfectly with in a double bill with Fudo, or are there just any other films that you guys think we should check out and we should harass a bunch of boutique Blu-ray labels and find out why they haven't put it out yet? And Jim, what else can they do? So, if you like this video, then please hit the like button. If you've been enjoying a Mad Science content then why not subscribe to our channel follow us on facebook if you have any comments or suggestions then leave those in the comment section down below thank you and goodbye thank you and cheers adam thank you cheers adam cheers guys <laughs>